Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is trading. Actually, it's the week of charts. Almost said it was trading simplified. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. You can attend these shows live if you'd like and ask questions about your favorite stock picks or trading in general by going to DaveLandry.com slash webinar. Register even the link is old. Also, the day of the webinar, which is Thursdays, you can go to my website and usually there's a banner right at the top. So obviously we can talk about current conditions. I'll have a plethora to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock in crypto picks, crypto. I messed that up in the last minute. But if you want to talk about crypto, I can't imagine there's a whole lot going on in crypto you want to talk about, but we can certainly talk about it. So I want to continue my discussion on a potpourri of trading knowledge. And there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I was going to talk a little bit about surviving a bear market, and some of that will come out in tonight's presentation, but I've done that presentation so many times. I got to think there's a lot of stuff I want to follow up. I want to show you some recent trades and maybe some ways to make a little money in between the sitting on our hands, which we've been doing a lot of lately, as you know, and market timing and intraday trades on a wide range bar. I had some good trades yesterday. I had some good ones today, but it was... Uh, Yesterday was definitely much, 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 much better. And I, I played a little close to the vest today. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right. A potpourri of trading knowledge, part two, and follow-up. Now, as you guys here know, I created the TFM 10% system a few years back. I forget how long ago it was. It's it's funny how fast time passes. It seems like I just created this thing, but it's had quite a few signals since it was created. It was created before the pandemic, and then obviously a sell, we had a sell signal during the pandemic, which we'll talk about. So I want to talk about where we are with the system and avoiding bad things like now. So just to recap real quick. The what I call the buy line, and it's actually really should be called the sell line, I guess, if you think about it, is 90% of the 50 week closing high. And if you look up here and anything that I plot through the ACP stock charts platform, you could see the parameters I used. And we had a sell signal right here, just to recap, get you up to speed. And then we had a buy, but this is what I would consider a weak buy signal. And as I've said quite a bit, I didn't even realize it was a buy signal because when I eyeballed the chart, it sure looks like the low is touching the moving average. Remember, you need two lows greater than the moving average or two bars of Landry light, which I'll flesh out in a few minutes for those who aren't familiar, for a buy signal. And it also has to be above the buy line, above the 90% line or within 10% of its 50 week closing high. And we had a sell signal. So the buy signal would have been a whipsaw. And as I've said a thousand times, the designer's intent of a system or anything trend following in nature that I will do because it's trend following will always buy on strength and not weakness. And I thought about adding in a few more parameters to the system, but I want to keep the system as simple as possible. So technically, that was a buy. Personally, I would not take it. I do put a little discretion on everything that I do. And then we had a subsequent sell signal right there. Now, as I said last week and weeks prior, the buy line takes a while to catch up to the market. 50 weeks, in fact. So it won't be right now. I think it had, I think it's now about 36 weeks since that 50 week closing high. So in another 15 or 14 weeks, the 50 week high will begin to drop. Obviously, each week it'll go from here to here. And then it might stay there for a little while, then eventually drop down to, to lower and lower levels to here. And then it will start following the, the market down lower. When you get into a bear market like 2000 that goes for a long time, in 2007, 2008 would be a good bear market too, the system eventually catches up to the market. But right now, we'd have to have one heck of a rally. Now, it was Vallejo and Gayard or Gade who once said that bad things happen 
below the, I think it was the 50 day moving average. It might've been the 200 day moving average. And I've yet to find the article, but I've heard somebody mention it a while back, probably David Keller or Charlie Carrick, one of those guys that do a lot of uh, really interesting research. But anyway, any type of trend indicator when it gets breached will possibly things could possibly get bad below that indicator so if you look at the 50-week moving average and the buy line you can see the bear market of 2000 things got pretty ugly then obviously below that line again in 2007 2008 i always say 2007 when i think about that bear market was because the reason i say 2007 2008 is because we got a lot of sell signals starting in October of 2007. You can actually go and look at the service archives from then and see that we started shorting heavily going into that slide because the database was producing a lot of shorts. But anyway, big slide once bad things begin to happen. Now, it's not always the case. And a couple of times since, the, since 2009, obviously 2010 and, and 2011, the market got a little iffy. And two things one it's okay to get out of the way and you'll notice we did have another one of those periods in 2015 2016 and even if you did get out the way you would just have a little bit of whipsaw even though it did turn into the mother of all downtrends and as i often have said in the past 2015 2016 that chop 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 that we went through then you were much better off being out of the market during that period a little sell off in 2019 obviously and then we had the pandemic sell off. Even though the market came right back, and you could argue it was a whipsaw, it was a 28% diaper change. And we'll take a look at that in one second. So we're down below the buy line and a 50 week moving average. So it's something to consider. And now it's not a, now I'm starting to speak at that. You know? And now it's not a good time to rush out and, and buy stocks. Now, the last whipsaw, if you took it, you would have lost 5%, which which sucks, don't get me wrong, but you would have avoided a 13% diaper change. Diaper change is something I stole from Ian McActivy. He's no longer with us, and he was a fantastic guy. One of the good guys. Uh, great presentation. I wish I could be half as good as he is, and that's being a little egotistical. Anyway, the diaper change is how much money you would have lost had you not exited when you did. So from that last exit signal I showed, you would have lost 13%. Now during the pandemic, as I often say, round numbers, 30% loss of your money. And I had friends and family that called me in a panic when they were down to 20%. And I can't imagine how they felt when they were down in a 28% range. Anyway, huge bear markets throughout history, big slides, 20% or more. And if you scroll all the way back to the Great Depression in here, you'll see there was an 83% diaper change. But anything, I think 20% or more, or even 10% or more, is fairly substantial. Now, this was left over when I did my last avoiding the next disaster speech. And the speech I did last summer while the market was making new highs was before the bomb blows up because nobody comes, as I've said, ad nauseum. Nobody calls me or comes to visit when the market is doing great. They wait until they're down 30% and call me up freaking out and kind of damned if I do and damned if I don't then. Uh, in one case, I, I feel I still feel bad about it to this day. It's like I said, well, you know, this is what it looks like historically. It could easily go down to 50%. And the NASDAQ was down 50%. And then it drops another 50%. And, and this person got out of the market. Of course, the market bottoms soon thereafter. But if you talk to me when the market is still at or near new highs or even down 8 or 9%, I can let you know what my system is saying should you want to follow it. And I find most people don't want to hear the bad news and i'll touch upon that in just one second so anyway as i've said quite a bit one thing I, I'm, I'm going to preach and i'm gonna touch upon this in just one second it's okay to be an investor i have at least one stock 
or just one stock that I've been in almost two years now, I think. I'll have to look at the date. I think it triggered in 2021 or 2020. I forget. I'll have to look. And that's only because the only reason I'm still in it is because it's in general has gone up and in general, well, actually has not stopped me out. And that's the only reason I'm still in it. I would suggest you have an uncle point in mind, a point where a uncle point for my international viewers is a point where you give up. And I don't know where that comes from. I used to have an uncle. He's pretty cool now. But uh, when I was a kid, you know, I'd give me a little titty twister and make you say uncle or whistle or something, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that, is that, if that's where that comes from. But anyway, so if you don't have an uncle point in mind, be willing to lose 50% of your money. And I've got a small position hodled in Bitcoin and it's down, I'll have to look, but it's probably down 50%. And that's okay because I I kind of went into it with the thinking, okay, I'm just gonna try out this hardware wallet and I'm gonna see what happens and then just try to forget about it. Very hard to do as a as a trader. And in between, I've, I've shorted here and there with some of the crypto. Now, if it's going down, it's not performing, obviously. And as I often preach, never buy a market because it's low. Now, I'm going to show you a little bounce play, but that's something completely different. And that was an intraday trade, actually, several intraday trades. I'll show you three or four of the trades that I made on Wednesday. And then, as I've said before, say hello to my little friend. The 30-day EMA is a great little indicator, especially when combined with Landry Light, so to speak. And all I have plotted here is the 30 EMA. And you don't actually need the Landry Light indicator at the bottom. I call it an illustrator because it helps to illustrate what's in the charts. But it turns red when the highs are less than the moving average. It turns green when the lows are greater than the moving average. There's a gap, so to speak, or lights in between the price and the moving average. And if the price is chopping back and forth, it kind of goes back and forth. So I just kind of put the general green in here, the generally red, just so you can see if it's green, you want to be mostly long. And I didn't include it in here. Now, this last little end of the trend wasn't fantastic. But obviously, if you go back prior to this, we had a pretty pretty good run coming into this beginnings of the chop or beginnings of the top, however you want to look at it. But do notice that it went green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. Now, if I kind of pick this apart on a micro level, when it starts flopping back and forth, that's kind of like more of a caution signal. So mostly green, you want to be long. Mostly red, you want to be short and chopping back and forth. Now, I'm not saying trade this mechanically, but use it as a general guideline to help in your trading. Now, I didn't get super bullish back here. And the reason being, I figured we were almost back to the old highs. So I could get bullish at new highs and I only have to wait about another, I forget what it was, like less than 2% or so, as opposed to jumping in and hanging on. And the market will do what it has to do to fool the most amount of people. It'll also do what it has to do to punish the most amount of people. And I say that often, that's an old, couple of old market adages that are related. Got them from, I got them from Linda Rasky. I talked to her. She said, I don't know where I got them from, probably off the floor. She's very modest. But anyway, as you can see, green is good and red is bad. And, and flipping back and forth between red and green means the market is kind of choppy. Now, I wanted to put the 50 simple moving average because I'm a huge fan, as you probably know, I know you want to party with me, of the 30 EMA. And I was wondering how it would do, how much lag it would have maybe with the 50. And to my surprise, and maybe I need to do a little bit more digging, it's there's not a whole lot of lag. And as I said last week when I was discussing lag with the TFM 10% system, because it does have a lot of lag in it, although when the market does slide at earnest, earnest to my surprise, as I said quite a bit, it did trigger a signal on a weekly chart, which is a weekly system, before the daily triggered on some of my patterns such as bow ties. So that was kind of cool. And my point here and my kind of minor discovery tonight in, in doing this, and this is why I love teaching this stuff, is because I get to see it and do it and, and I enjoy it. 
and it also helps me in my actual trading. But to my surprise, there really isn't a tremendous amount of lag in that 50, and maybe a little bit more research needs to be done. And maybe what I need to do is overlay another Landry light below it and compare it to the 30. But in this case, maybe lag is your friend. And the great thing about Landry light is it's not waiting for a moving average to cross over or a moving average to turn down or a moving average to turn up, but rather it's waiting for price to interact with that moving average. And as I discovered by accident, I suppose, during the pandemic, when we got that sell so fast, that sell signal so fast, if price really gets whacked, you will get the Landry light below the moving average really quickly. In fact, that's something that you might want to take a look at is how fast do you get Landry light, especially after it's stretched away from the moving average. But anyway, the last little downslide we had, serious downslide, mostly downside Landry light. Now, they're hard to see in this dark chart, but I do have some dotted lines in here and you could set those parameters. Right now I have them set to 10, which is a good round number. So in, in order to avoid chasing your own tail, maybe wait for 10 bars of Landry light before thinking about getting long, okay? Now, I'm just kind of noticing this here, but let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, aha. Okay, we got 10 bars of Landry light. Dave says a trend may be developing. Well, hang on a second. This market looks like it could be rolling right back over. So that little bit of discretion might help you out, okay? And then you can do the same thing on the downside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, market's improving, and then maybe not, okay? Just be careful waiting too long on the downside because obviously they, they slide faster than they glide. If you're a pilot, please don't email me and explain that a, a glide actually goes down. <laughs> I know, I know, but just work with me, okay? Anyway, we're back to the red again. We don't have 10 bars though, just for what it's worth. So as I said before, and I forget exactly when, but it was sometimes early this year when I received the TFM 10% system, sell system, and I talked to a buddy that uh, I used to work out with. It's uh, He heard his shoulder quit working out, and ironically, I, I heard my shoulder too. <laughs> I guess God punished me for for um, harassing him about not working out. But anyway, I was like, well, you need to talk to your guy. I said, I said, I, I just got a sell signal and you need to talk to your guy. And he's like, I did. I said, well, what did he say? It's like, well, he said, we're getting more aggressive now the market is lower. And I'm like, oh God, you know, I, I must have rolled my eyes. And, and, and as I've said before, he goes, well, my guys made me a lot of money. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> But his guy probably never looked at a longer term chart. He never noticed that the market can go down for a long time and certainly maybe take 25 years or more to make new highs. And people usually don't believe me on that. That's why the layman's guide to trading stocks, I forget which year I wrote that, 2008. I made sure I put those longer term charts in there. Now, the market, as I said, will will often do the obvious in an unobvious manner and also do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people. And it had that really good rally that put us within 2% of all time high. So all is good in the world. And he was probably feeling pretty good about his guy making him all that money. And then of course what happened is the market rolled right back over. So I was willing to give it a couple of extra percents. And that's what trend following is all about. You need to wait for that trend to get established. Or if you're at lower levels, then wait for some sort of transitional pattern, such as the bow tie. So 2007, 2008, 2008, I guess is when bottom was. You wait for that transitional pattern. 2003, 2004 bottom you wait for some sort of transitional pattern, like a daily bow tie or something like that. But anyway, it rolled over, and then I'm sure this last rally gave people a lot of false hope, and then the market came back in. Now, we did go long some individual stocks because they were setting up, and we did get stopped out of some of them, and, and some of them were still in. It's not that I won't buy stocks 
when we're in a bear market, I'll buy stocks if they're set up, and I'll buy stocks when the market begins to improve. And the database is what tells me to do that. When people say, well, what do you mean listen to the database? Well, as I preach ad nauseum, I go through a couple thousand stocks every night, roughly, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. And from that, I call out the ones that I, I vaguely like or the ones that look like they're trending and if they're not set up perfectly, they could set up soon. And I copy that over to my momentum list. And then I go through that momentum list a little bit more slowly and a little more carefully. And usually most of the stocks that I'm going to trade the next day are in that momentum list already. And if there's something that really, really stands out, it'll be added in, obviously, when I'm going through the, the big scan. And by the way, nothing I do is proprietary. All the stuff I will share with you. And my scans are on the back end of the website. I don't remember if you have to be a member or not to get to them. But I'll, if you're not a member, I'll, I'll share them with you. Some random thoughts on market timing. I think some market timing is better than none. And you don't have to be a rocket science to, to time a market or to know when a market is behaving badly. And I think that's what kind of scares everybody away is when I try to explain to them these simple systems. Maybe I do a poor job, but the bottom line is if the market is not performing well, and you could use some really simple performance metrics, then you might want to get out of the way or think about getting out of the way or ask your guy. It's like, okay, guy, uh, the market went down 50% in 2000 and it went down, it took in, hit uh, in 2008, it went down about 50% and it hit 13 year lows. So if I had to put a bunch of money in the market 13 years prior, because the market always goes up, almost a decade and a half later, I'd be losing money. So how do you guys compensate for that? And by the way, one thing I've been working on or noodling with at least on and off is technical analysis apologetics. And there's so much good stuff you can get from Greg Morris on that. And, and that's just basically defending technical analysis. And those buy and hold metrics, as I talked about in trading full circle, in, the, in my trading full circle course, are based on 81 years, or based on an 81-year time horizon. And I have a little sweet brown pop up and say, ain't nobody got time for that. So it doesn't take rocket science to time a market. Even I could do it. Even a caveman could do it. Even a system with moron in the name, people will ask me to this day, what does TFM 10% stand for? Trend volume moron 10% system. Could do quite well. And the system was designed to help you avoid those diaper change moments. So it's especially well at, it does especially well at avoiding diaper change moments. So again, you want to think in terms of performance-based investing and think about that for all your investments, okay? And trading is not like life in, in many ways, but in a few ways it is, okay? And one of the ways it is, is like, as I've done presentations on before and written random thoughts on, you have to be a bit of a tyrant and you have to you have to be like a mean boss, and if you've got three employees that are busting in a butt and one guy is sitting on his butt, you got to fire that one guy, right? Uh, if you're, I'm not into fantasy football. My daughter just got a new job and um, she's talking about her teams and stuff. And, and I watched her do the little draft the other night. And, you know, she's not going after the, the shitty players that might become good players someday. She's going after the best players she can. And so... You need to think in those terms, think of performance-based investing. And that's why I'm still in the stock for going on two years now, because it's done really well. It's up 400 and something percent. But as soon as it stops me out, I'm going to say so long and thanks for all the fish. That's what happens. As I said, ad nauseum every night and say every night, shit happens that it could take a long time to come back, greater than 25 years. A lot of people don't believe me on that. Don't believe me, look at the charts, okay? Now, avoiding the diaper change is key, and this is both from a mental and a monetary standpoint. I have, a friend of mine was visiting 
during the pandemic or when the pandemic slide was in earnest and he wasn't sleeping because he was losing so much money so fast in the markets. John says, I thought I was trend following master. <laughs> no, trend following moron. <laughs> You're just being John. nice, John. I know you know that. All right. VIX fever. And got to be careful when I get excited about something because that's when I could lose a lot of money. And I did have couple of VIX trades, one in particular this week, and that was yesterday. And I'm going to walk you through that in just one second. So just to kind of get everybody up to speed, and I know everybody here is rolling their eyes because I'm saying the same thing over because we've talked about it past several weeks and, and many times past that. Prior to that, I've written some VIX systems inspired by Larry Connors and, and working with Larry Connors. Uh, shit, how many years ago was that? maybe 17, 18 years ago. And the stuff really prints money for a while. It's one of those things that works until they don't. <laughs> it, it, I was amazed at how well it did looking back toward the, uh, looking back until I hit the pandemic. And then it kind of blew up a little bit. And before that, it looks like it was doing pretty good. And it's something that I learned quite a few years ago that purely short-term stuff can work really well, but you need that, occasional home run to to pay for the inevitable losses and, and occasional big spankings. And that's the whole premise behind the core methodology. But I forget how long ago it was, maybe a year or maybe just six months or, or whenever I got on this VIX kick, I noticed that you can occasionally, if you play your cards just right, make some money on an intraday basis. Now, I'm not a huge day trader, but I'm here all, all day anyway, and especially now that I'm doing two shows a week, this one and Trading Simplified. It's a it's a lot of work. I know you would never know it by looking at it, <laughs> but it's a lot of it's a lot of work to put these shows together. So I'm really busy, and I'm 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 here 99% of the time while the market is open anyway. So I'm able to occasionally take some of these trades, but occasionally is the key word in that sentence and it's something that I need to adhere to. And I'll touch upon that in just one second too. Just to get you up to speed, this little, this is the, probably the most complex thing I'll ever show you. It's the S&P 500 in background. It's a 10 day simple moving average of the VIX, okay? And the, indicator in the middle is just measuring how far away the moving average is from the VIX. So cyan is the close and the purple is the open. And I added the high this week because I find, I found the high kind of interesting because maybe just maybe you could get a big spike intraday and it would be great to know how far away you are from the moving average on that spike to start looking for that reversion to the mean move. And down below is the VIX range. And this will save your buttocks quite a bit. I use a very similar formula in the ETFs and I'll touch upon that in just a second, if not the exact formula. And my premise here is if a if a market is going to make a wide range bar, it's going to have to expand past this narrow range bar first. So with the VIX, and you might use 100%, but with ETFs on a non-opening gap reversal day, or non-gap day, I should say, in general, I like to see an ETF move 50% or at least look like it's going to move 50%, like 30 or 40% of its normal range. So its normal range is this. I want to see it about 30 or 40% of its normal range in 50% ideally. Now, but Dave, won't you sometimes buy the top? Yes, you will in doing that. But you need to count how many times it keeps you out of trouble. If I'm sitting here and I don't feel like working, which is quite often, <laughs> and I'm watching the screen instead, and I see that bar that big, okay, on a 15 minute bar, and I'm like, holy crap, this lab U or lab D or socks L, whatever is going to the moon, I better jump in. And then I tell myself, settle down Beavis. And I take a look at a daily chart and it doesn't look that big on a daily. And then I notice 
on a daily chart, my range might only be like 20% of the normal range. So even though it looks like a huge range expansion on that 15 minute chart, it might not be that big of a deal. So the VIX, with the VIX, VIX it's especially true. You wanna wait for that range to begin to expand before getting too excited and going after the, the VIX. So there's a formula right there. Just the today's high minus low because the open happens overnight, and if a gap happens, it, you can't trade that as part of the range. So just simply the high minus low divided by yesterday's average true range. That's it. So again, the indicator here, we got the open, the close, and then I added in the high to that. And as a general statement, when it's 10% or more away from the moving average, you want to look to short the VIX or and or go long stocks and possibly some other ETFs as I'll show you in a minute. And if it's 10% or more below the moving average, which suggests there's some complacency in the market, the option prices have come way down, the implied volatility on those options have come way down, then it means that the market might be due to have a bit of a sell-off. So we take a look at yesterday's open and the high and the open were right around 10 percent away from the moving average ideally i want to see it a lot further away but the market was so damn oversold i figured it might be worth i figured it might be worth a shot and i don't just blindly buy svxy or uvxy when these things are stretched I wait for some sort of reversion to the mean to begin to kick in. So as I saw that VIX start to implode a little bit and stocks appear to be gaining some footing, I figured if stocks could hang on to their gains and continue higher, then the VIX would continue higher too. So I was very careful getting not getting too excited in this first wide range bar, but after it looked like everything was going to keep on going, I triggered in right there. Now I figured, okay, if it goes down and takes out the low of the day, then I'm wrong. So that gave me a, a well defined parameter. Now, as you can see in a minute, some of you are going to laugh. I'm not betting the farm on this, but I am doing it, doing it across multiple accounts. So even small trades can add up a little. And we'll talk about that in one second. And I put in an automated 50 cent trailing stop. Now, as a general rule, and as you'll see with, with Lab D or Lab U in a minute, Lab U, my like Lab U's 30 cents is a good round number there, give or take a little. And if I'm using a 30 cent trailing stop, I'm going to take profits at a 30 cent initial profit target, okay? But with this SVXY, and it was a small position anyway, I was thinking I'd like to try to squeeze a point out of it, and I'm going to use a half a point stop. And should this thing keep blowing and going, then I'll let that half a point stop become a one point stop, become a two point stop, and so on and so forth, to hopefully ride out a really, really nice intraday trend. So anyway, I had about a point here, and then I exited the rest market on close. And there's a trades down there. I only did 200 shares in this one account. And the first trade netted 96 cents, close enough to a dollar, which I was looking for. And then the closing trade netted a dollar 11. So $207, better than a poke in the eye. And, you know, it, I like to annualize, which makes my wife, which drives my wife crazy, which is a short trip. But fortunately, she doesn't watch these shows. I'm half kidding. Uh, <laughs> but $200 a day is 50 grand a year extra. So that's better than poking the eye. And again, if you do it on more than one account, it would be a little bit more. As I said in many presentations prior, I'd rather go long UVXY than SVXY because the, the explosion of the VIX can be a lot more impressive than the implosion of the VIX. Now, one thing I am kind of noticing though is, is when the market does begin to reverse 
something like the SVXY can be a little cleaner in its trend. You could use a little bit tighter stop and maybe a little bit less risk. It only matters when it matters. I'd love to show you a VIX trade every week. I'd love to show you a VIX trade every day, but you might sit on your hands for a while. And this week's example wasn't the best example in the world, but the fact that the market was so oversold, as we'll look at in one second, and beginning to reverse, I figured that VIX is going to back off a little bit, and it was worth the SVXY. But again, don't be a hero. Wait for a turn. And even though I felt like the turn was in, it, the first couple of bars, the first 30, 45 minutes, I was doubting myself a little bit. But I said, you know what? Screw it. I got to stop in place. I'm going to lose a half a point, 100 bucks on this trade, maybe a little bit more on another trade. But so what? I can live with that, right? And if it ha you know, if it gets stopped out, it gets stopped out. Now it happens. And by that, I mean, let's say you, you're trading a short-term system and it, it, it puts you all in on a market and you're gonna stay in the market for three days. Well, day one, you're doing good. Day two, you're doing good. Day three, the market tanks and you lose everything you made in the first two days plus everything you made in the last six months. So that's why I'm kind of shying away from these pure short-term systems but I'm okay with an intraday trade. And by the way, Wednesday, although I made a lot of trades on Wednesday, Wednesday was, I wouldn't say relaxing, but one of the more relaxing days where I just let everything work and I let the stops take me out and I let the initial profit targets as limit orders take me out. And I'll show you a couple of those trades. And it was one of the more relaxing days, I would say about than, than lately, than I've had lately when it comes to trading. As I've been preaching, the VIX is not a price chart. I see people draw head and shoulders, bottoms and tops and other stuff. And some of it may work, but as a general statement, a price chart reflects the, the feelings and emotions of the participants, whereas a volatility chart is measure, measuring something completely different. Volatility is reversion to the mean market, although it can get really, really stretched, which is fine, which we could use our advantage as opposed to a trending market. As I've been saying, it's complicated. VIX ETFs are based on VIX futures, and you don't want to hold them more than one day because there's contango and all kinds of crazy stuff that's happening, decay. So the market was oversold. It just went pretty much straight down for a long, long time. So shorter term, it was oversold. Longer term, it was oversold. It's hitting multi-month lows. It just really felt like the negativity was coming back in. All the headlines were super negative. And then it just felt like we were due for a bounce. Now, when I saw the VIX begin to come in a little bit, I began to think, okay, it looks like we might have a bit of a bounce. And I also saw the futures began to rally a little bit. And I did, I did trade the e minis too on Wednesday. And I had that position work, and it looks like it was doing okay. And I said, okay, I'm going to do an add-on, but this time I'm just going to throw on a couple hundred shares of the SVXY. And as I showed earlier, the VIX was somewhat stretched, not a perfect example. Like I said, 10% or more would be a good round number, and I'd like to see it even further away. But I figured the market was so oversold, it's right at about 10%. Based on the open and the high, if you're looking at those two numbers, then I figured, okay, well, it's starting to come back in. Looks like the VIX is going to implode a little bit here. It might be worth a shot. Let's get long stocks. And I got long stocks via e minis and then some ETFs, as I'll show you in one second, some of them at least. And like I said, that was working and the VIX was coming in. So I felt like the wind was at my back a little bit in these positions. And that's one thing I want to talk about in a few minutes is less is more. So if you are going to do some intraday trading, make sure you have the wind at your back and try to figure out how to go in and have a good day like Wednesday. And I had an okay day today because I, I played it close to the vest and I didn't do a lot of trading and I didn't risk a lot. And, and it turned out to be an okay day because we did have a little follow through to the upside today after a bit of an opening lap reversal. But the thing I'm working on really hard, and I'll show you my mind map of this that I just kind of started putting together this morning, is but the thing I'm working really hard on is less is more. How do I 
go days and maybe even weeks without taking any intraday trades. Now, the intraday trades is not my bread and butter. It's something that I do talk about a lot in more recent years, simply just because I'm here, I'm so busy and the screens are there and you know, four screens over here or three over here and two right here. So <laughs> lots of shiny objects, all these flickering ticks all around me. And you can get yourself in a lot of trouble, especially if you have time to trade. So I have to be super careful and I do keep myself busy and that keeps me off the screen too much or does help me a little bit. But if I could figure out when not to trade, I would own the world and, and you'd never see my fat ass again. <laughs> But you can see the market obviously begin to take off, but you wanna wait for it to start moving. You don't wanna be a hero. You don't wanna catch that falling knife. So it looks like some of my animations didn't take, but the the socks was really taken off on Wednesday. This is a 15 minute chart. And I was tempted to jump in, but I said to myself, self, let's just see where this takes us. And then the market not only faked out higher, it did begin to sell off, and then it faked out lower and it came back. Now, I didn't try to catch that bottom. I waited for the breakout, and you can see where I bought there. So my buy was at 1149. Now, I think I got into biotech a little bit earlier because the semis weren't just weren't taken off, but biotech was. Biotech, by the way, on a relative strength basis, has been really strong as of late, and we'll look at it in live charts. So anyway, that was my buy, and I wasn't feeling too good about the trade, obviously, because it immediately went against me. And I did think long and hard about scratching, but I've had so much going on, presentations to work on, and stuff to catch up on, and it's like, you know what? Just put the stop in and forget about it. That's a trailing stop. In this case, I think it was 30 cents. And or maybe 50 cents, I forget. But you can see, after all was said and done, it was only 200 shares, no, 400 shares, and it only made $142. Well, that's 30, extra 36,000 a year, who's counting? <laughs> now, LabVIEW, like I said earlier, did, did trigger a little bit earlier, okay? So we had that first 15 minute bar, and then it kind of futzed around a little bit, but then begin to take off. Now, in this one, this case, I know for a fact I was using the 30 cent stop. And I did take these again across multiple accounts, but this is a good representative example. 1,000 shares, 30 cent stop. Now that's a $300 risk, which obviously you don't wanna, you wanna lose $300 a day, right? Because that's, that's 75 grand a year. How do I do that so fast? <laughs> because I do it all day long. But my thinking is, okay, I'm gonna risk 30 cents. And this, this logic, I know it can get you into trouble, but I'm gonna use a trailing stop and I'm assuming, and occasionally I do buy the high tech and get stopped out for the full loaf or the full 30 cents. But my thinking is maybe the market will move enough for me to have that stop begin to trail higher. Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Sometimes I will go in and take a really tight stab at a market. And if I get stopped out, so what? I lose a little bit and then I'm willing to go back in. And then if it begins to move in my favor, then I'll open that stop up. But I'm trying to be more and more hands off so I can work on all these projects. And on Wednesday, I was very tempted to scratch out all these trades and just do my work, my other work. And had I done that, I would have missed out on possibly one of the better days, certainly probably the best day of September so far, the better better days from all the last couple of months. But anyway, IPT was somewhere around here and I got out for 30 something cent gain. I let that automated trailing stop do its job all day. And you know, ideally this happens earlier in the day, once this is at break even, I try not to look at the screen at all. Now, but Dave, why would you even look at the screen when you got all this other stuff in there? It's like, well, I'll set alarms, let's say at 25 cents or 20 cents even, if I'm looking for 30 cents. So 
I could be alerted to the fact that, hey, you're getting closer at IPT, don't split hash, should it not blow through? And so I'll get an order queued up and I'll have a market order ready to hit send, but I'll leave that. What happens is when you put the new order in, cancel and replace, the old order stays in place. So let's say it's at uh, 60, is, I'm looking for 60, it's at 55, 56, 57, and I'm getting ready to hit enter and it goes 55 again and I give it like one more cent and if it doesn't take off, I'll get out and I'll make a tiny bit less on the first loaf, but in a case like this, which I, I actually was able to get the full full amount on the first loaf, but let's say that I didn't, but in a case like this, that second loaf is going to make all the difference in the world. So add all these up, and this one was exited, as you can see, market on close, which is uh, one of my new favorite things. Uh, I've been using them for years, but it's I just think it's a cool thing. Automated stops, limit orders, and market on close. Limit orders for profit taken on intraday stuff, and stop entries are a good thing too. But the combo of those three can be really powerful, and if you're discipline, can allow you to be hands off in this stuff. And I'm hesitant to call it day trading because my goal is to capture an intraday trend. And I want as many things behind me as possible. But Dave, you're, you're buying a market that's oversold. Yeah, because I'm looking for that intraday bounce. I'm looking for that intraday trend. I wouldn't buy stocks in general because they're oversold and then hang on to them because that's a, that's a fool's errand. And what do I preach? As I said a minute ago, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. Stocks look cheap. NASDAQ looked cheap in 2000 when it was down 50%. And then it dropped another 50%. Don't believe me? Look at the charts. Anyway, this netted 442. That's uh, 130,000 extra dollars. If you can do it every day. Now, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. But the reason I'm pointing out the annualization of this is twofold. One, if you can pick up a little money here and there, it adds up. And two, if you risk a little money here and there, it adds up too. And the reason I'm talking about both sides of my mouth is like, you actually want to wait for a trade like this. This is a thing of beauty, although it didn't, didn't, it could have been much, much better. Maybe a point move or something would have been fantastic. But you might have to wait a few weeks for this to set up like it did. All right, any questions on that or anything? I published this, I started working on this and I call it a one-page strategic plan, OPSP, for trading. And uh, I guess it just, it's just a mind map. And this is, this is what I came up with real quick. The core methodology is the bread and butter. IPOs are the next best thing. And uh, I got an email from one of you guys last week saying that you've made mon more money off one of my IPO patterns and everything else combined. And that stuff really prints money, but only when... IPOs are doing well, and and as John pointed out, John's our resident expert on IPOs in the in the, in the Facebook group. IPOs suck lately, and and John's right, they have sucked lately. But anyway, that's my kind of idea to 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 put it down in front of me, and maybe keep this up on a monitor here and there to make sure that I'm focusing on what needs to be done. And I started breaking down the intraday trading today. And I'm not going to bore you and go through all this. One day, I'm sure I will. But the one thing I did want to point out here is less is more. And then these are all the things that I'm doing to be careful. And one thing I thought of was hubris plus one or HG day plus one. Holy grail day is when the market starts at one end and goes crazy. It's straight up or starts at one end and goes crazy and straight down. Uh, I guess Wednesday was somewhat of a holy grail day, but I have noticed that after my biggest days come my worst days because I'm all full of myself. Big day, big, big day thinks he's a grand pumba, comes in flush with cash, and then proceeds to piss it away the next day. So that's one thing that I have noticed. And the way you notice these things, if you're obstinate and not tracking it okay and how could you not 
think about it at least, but the way you come to these realizations, these little tiny epiphanies, is you wake up every morning, as I've been saying, and you write those three morning pages, three handwritten pages, and you're like, hey, I had a really good day, and the next day you're like, boy, did I suck today. I gave up several thousand dollars that I made the day before on these intraday trades. And you do that enough, you begin to think, okay, well, maybe I need to develop some sort of commitment devices to keep me from giving away all that money the next day. So like today, I played a really close to vest. And by writing this down this morning, this hubris plus one and then HD day plus one, it reminded me to be super duper careful with my intraday trading and don't give up all those gains that I made on Wednesday. So anyway, this is just scratching the surface here. I'm gonna add to it quite a bit and talk about a lot of the branches. VIX stretch, we talked about that tonight. Ogres, by the mother of all ogres, that's opening gap reversals. I wanna see ideally kind of a thick stock where there's a lot of players and everybody wants in and it's got great momentum and it's got a, a nice little pullback or TKO type of setup and it just gets annihilated. Those things, or like butter, they don't happen that often, hence the less is more branch. And then you figure out when not to trade, again, you'll own the world. But if you figure it out, write me a letter. Uh, just real quick, the E-minis, tread lightly in the E-minis, and I do, and, and I get a little full of myself and sort of trading them. Years ago, I traded the, the big contract in futures, and that was brutal, and I've forgotten how brutal E-minis can be. And you got to be really, really careful with them. So I've scaled way back in my E-mini trading, and my life has gotten a lot better. Uh, the 5, 10, 15, 20, this is something I'm toying with. It, it, it hasn't worked fantastically, but it can work if you get it just right. And by that, I mean, let's say you're getting the reversion to the mean move and the VIX and the markets looks like it's taken off or whatever. You might go in with a super tight stop and then... When you're up five points, let it open up five points. When you're up 10 points, let it open up another five points and so on and so forth to where you end up with a free, so to speak, position. Now, don't rush out and try this. This is something I tread very lightly with. Uh, RTF, that's race to finish. Sometimes late in the day within the, like, let's say the last 10 minutes, but it can also be the last half hour. But it's a little bit less risky going in the last 10 minutes if all of a sudden the market begins to have this huge charge and everybody is just rushing to get out by the close or rushing to get in by the close, sometimes you can take advantage of that situation and maybe do the 5, 10, 15, 20 thing. But I'll flesh all this out over time. The bottom line tonight, the reason I wanted to show you this, you know me, as soon as I start working on something, I can't wait to show you. But the less is more and this mind mapping thing, I did this years ago and I've forgotten how valuable it is just be able to just being able to see all this. If I try to think about HD day hunting and ogres and and all this other stuff that I'm looking at, it's gonna be hard for my brain to process that all. But if I look at this picture, I can go, oh, okay, I got it. Anyway, reason I underline recent chop fest is the market's been really really choppy and been getting chewed up and. You know, I show you these great trades, but believe me, I get chewed up quite a bit in between. And that's what I'm working really, really hard on. Don't get chewed up. And like George pointed out earlier, he, he posted a picture of his computer with a sticky note on it that said, do nothing. And it's like, amen, George, you, you're getting it. Okay. Fantastic. Less is more. All right. If you're not a member of Facebook group, I'd love to have you. You do have to have a little skin in the game, though. You have to be a member of DaveLander.com. I will throw out opening gap reversals on occasion. Hadn't been in many lately, or hadn't been any lately. There hasn't been any IPO stuff, but I will throw that out. John and some of the other guys, I know the other guys are getting jealous. So I see some other guys beginning to step up with the IPOs, and that's great. So it's a great group. I love the group. I get a lot out of it. I make money off the group from the group recommendations, but you do have to have a little skin in the game. All right, let's take a look at crypto real quick, and then we'll take a look at stocks. If there's anything you guys want to look at, at in crypto, let me know now. I'm just going to take a look at like Bitcoin. I'll do a quick RS scan and see where where the money is. 
if there's any, and then we'll go from there. Let me get the screen shared. So crypto, and then go ahead and start asking about stocks if you want at this point. So we take a look at Bitcoin. And one thing that I've done before, which is pretty amazing, is if you plot Bitcoin underneath stocks, there's almost 100% correlation, or the correlations can be really, really high. And that's a bit of a bummer because my hope, boy, and I tell you, you hope in this business, you get in trouble fast, right? <laughs> you know, my hope by hodling just a tiny bit, and I'm talking about not much. Uh, some of you guys will ask me how much Bitcoin should I own? Like, not much, okay? Because if it really, really takes off, then 1% of your portfolio, it'll be worth 100 times more, okay? So that 1% would be 100 times more. So maybe 1% of your portfolio, maybe not even that much. But you see, Bitcoin is not doing so hot. Take a look at this Landry light here, okay? It did find a little support towards its old lows. I wouldn't rush out and buy it because of that. Maybe on an intraday bounce, go in and play a little bit. Sometimes I'll play Bitcoin on an intraday bounce. And sometimes I'll look at um, the future ETFs. What is it? BITO and BT, B-I-T-I. How would you say that? BT? Ethereum, we'll take a look at that real quick. Ethereum has generally been strong as of late, or stronger, at least on a relative strength basis. I know they're going to a proof of stake model, which which sounds great for the environmentalists. And I get it, you know, they are burning up a lot of electricity to mine this Bitcoin. But a proof of stake, you could cheat. And uh, the wealthy people get paid the most. And obviously, the wealthy people get paid the most, I guess, with the with the farming. But even a relatively small guy, I wouldn't do it on my own, try to rush out and, and start a Bitcoin farm. Although I did look into it, of course, and I've done presentations about that. I'd much rather be a trader and try to make some money that way as opposed to trying to mine Bitcoin, which is a horrible, I think, way to try to do business. So I don't know what that is. It gets Ethereum taken off. but in the RS scans, as I've said before, there are times when you just come in and buy the strongest ones. And now is not one of those times. And I have done very little crypto trading. Now, here's the thing. I really need to be looking at these charts every day in case something takes off. But it's just that the market has just been so horrible. I'm not seeing anything worthwhile. And if you guys want to take a look at anything, let me know. Let me shift gears and jump to stocks. I think I've kind of said pretty much what I want to say about stocks. The S&P 500, obviously pretty serious slide as of late. We're kind of in bounce mode now. I'd be really, really careful holding anything overnight other than your, your core trend trade positions. And right now we're in ARLP, EMBC, and the other one escapes me in a second. Oh, Verve, V-E-R-V, V-E-R-V. And Verve, as you can see, kind of hanging in there. ARLP, we've been in forever. How long have we been in this one? Since we got in right here, I think, 2021. So a year and change, almost two years. Anyway, S&P 500, you can see stalled out, rolled back over. ARRP, thank you, John. Uh, January 6th, uh, 2021. So that's where, yeah, I remember it was it was a setup coming out of 2020 and triggered in 2021. And that's, you know, like the hokey pokey. That's what trend following is all about. Now, we obviously get stopped out a lot earlier on most of our positions in a year and a half or a year and three quarters, but so far so good on that one. NASDAQ bounce, as you can see, it's been headed lower fairly persistently as of late. Draw a line through as many bars as you can intersect. That's persistency or just eyeball it as I normally do. A little bit of follow through from that bounce. I would be darn careful no matter what you did in this market right now, even on the intraday stuff and maybe especially intraday stuff. Wait for that VIX to get stretched again one way or the other, maybe, or wait for some sort of patterns and some of these things to set up. Russell 2000, bit of a bounce. Again, don't rush out and buy the market. 
the energies on a relative strength basis have been much stronger. My concern here has been saying quite a bit is when you get a, a bottom at a top. So this was the top, right? Then you get the market that bottoms out after a pretty serious sell off after what appears to be a top. If it comes right back, that's usually dangerous because by the time it gets back to its old highs, it's already very, very, very overbought. So I'm a little cautious on the energies right now, even though on an RS basis, they're doing pretty good. As I've been preaching that knowledge, a lot of areas look like the market itself. There's financials, transports are kind of all over the place. They look kind of like the market itself as of late. One standout, as I said in the service tonight is Biotech's looking pretty good in here. We had a, a good day yesterday and a good day today. So it looks to be improving quite a bit, and that's actually banks. But Biotech, trust me, had a good day yesterday and today. There it is. Okay, I thought I thought it was a little bit better. You can see, we, like the banks kind of look like the market itself, that deep, deep, deep sell-off, whereas Biotech didn't go so deep in its sell-off. And you know we could probably throw something like a 50-day simple moving average. You can see we really didn't get much daylight below that simple moving average, and then bam, we take off again today. We could always add a 30 EMA in there. 30 just for shits and giggles. Exponential. I'm getting hungry. So you can see the 30 exponential. We dip below, and now we're back well back above it. So that's kind of cool there anyway not a whole lot to talk about in the market other than again a lot of sectors look like the market itself semiconductors recent rollover a little bit of a bounce all right george says ali is ali setting up oh look at that funny looking thing down there look at that funny indicator i wonder what that is <laughs> sometimes people email me talking about stochastic i'll say what's a stochastic go spend three pages telling me what a stochastic is I'm telling them uh, it was a joke. Okay, George wants to know if this is a possible short. I'm going to say no. Now, if this was this was all time highs on this thing and it's just pulled back a little bit like this, then I'd say yes. But it's just it's already at fairly low levels in here, and it's also kind of all over the place. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. I'm not really finding anything worth shorting right now. So I would pass on that. He says, this is a short via a bow tie. Let's see if I can get the bow tie to work. There it is. Um, yeah, if this bow tie was coming off of all-time highs, it would be a textbook bow tie. Look how pretty that is. Good eye, George. Except that I'm not that excited about shorting something here. I'd much rather short something that's coming off of all-time highs like it did back here. But in general, the stock is kind of wide and loose and all over the place. And I'm not picking on you, but in general, I noticed, and this is just because there's not a great, lot of great setups out there. I noticed a lot of you guys and gals are looking at some stocks that are a little bit mediocre. And what I recommend you do is just, just sit on your hands. Keep doing your research, but maybe wait for something to knock your socks off before going into this market. Now, uh, Stuart's asking about CRYX as a short. Same sort of thing as the... You know, it's kind of an okay looking bow tie. If this was an all time high, and you know, maybe that's what we're left with these stocks, short any stocks that are already at lower levels. But ideally, to short something, you want to short something up here, okay? And you want to be first in like this, and you want to ride that for as long as possible. Now, one thing I'm noticing too, Stuart, is Notice the average volume on this is only 378, and today's volume was 215. And HV is not too, too crazy, but it is, is it a biotech or something? It's something, oh, I don't know what, oh, shipping. Okay, shipping stocks are kind of crazy. They can act very erratic. So I would be careful just because it's kind of thin. Even if you can borrow it, you can get in a lot of trouble quickly. And they'll squeeze you out, and then it'll roll right back over. All right, any more setups? Okay, George got it. Good, good job, George. You're getting there, man. It's it's been fun watching you. It really has been. HRB as a short. I like that you guys are looking at shorts. Uh, not yet, but hey, I like the way you think, Jeff. Okay, it's not quite there. Now, here's the thing. 
I often talk about stocks being priced for perfection. And people are like, what do you mean? And it's like, I don't know. I just thought it was, everybody knew that, right? Like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. But this stock, what's the market done? Okay, pretty much going down lately, right? And this stock is going straight up. So if this stock comes out with bad earnings or any bad news or the CEO gets caught shagging his secretary or whatever, I guess I just demonetized my video. I'm kind of vulgar tonight, huh? <laughs> Trading will do that to you. It's like every trader, Linda Rasky met an F, dropped an F bomb like when I for like, like within two minutes of meeting her or 30 seconds of meeting her. I'm like, holy crap, you really do trade. <laughs> um 20 something years ago. Jeez, I'm getting old. That was 1993 or 94. Anyway, yeah, keep an eye on that. You know, it's like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna look at this every day, wait for the short, but as soon as it sets up as a little bit of a bow tie or first thrust or whatever, it'll it'll be worth a shot. But yeah, wait for this thing to dive down and rally back a little bit. And good eye, Jeff. Keep that on your list as a possible short. You too, George, but I wouldn't rush out and short it just yet. All right. Any anything else? Going once, going twice. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. Looks like the numbers are going up again, so fantastic. I'm glad you guys are finding the show. Again, if you need to find the show, just go to davelearner.com slash webinar. Maybe I need to take the date out of that so people will realize it's going to be the next available webinar. And if you sign up for one, you're signed up for hopefully forever, at least until the middle of next year. So thank everybody for watching, and may the trend be with you.